fog is rolling in. We were told there's no fog on this side. You liars. Liars, you Shetland liars, you. I thought we were due for yet another day reading our mind-improving books when suddenly, and rather miraculously, halfway through a bacon sandwich, the mist rolled away again in the space of just a few minutes. This is an amazing climate. For us sailors of the modern era, if I may be so bold as to describe myself at 60 as a modern sailor, the sound of departure is a noisy affair as we shout over the roar of the Volvo. For thousands of years, though, departures were quiet affairs with just the sound of wind, the flap of sail and the distant curlews. I've been a sailor for half a century and the miracle of that tiny, barely perceptible breeze shifting a four-ton ship box still knocks me sideways and fills me with wonder. When she starts to move and the rudder starts to bite, you get that frisson of pleasure coming through the tiller, up through your arm and into your soul. A truly glorious experience. Wind is quite strong from the south today, so it will be a bit rough when we get out, but in the meantime, Sailing quietly up this bow. It's a sort of fetch. My lovely red sail is doing its job. Ha oh. ha! The mussel farms are as thick as thieves in these bows, a sentence I'd never expected to utter. But such is this journey. The mussels cling to ropes, hanging beneath the baby bath-sized boys sucking silently on salt water, hoping to extract the tiniest bits of crud to eat. It takes over a year to grow from a pea-sized baby to an adult big enough to be harvested and then without mercy or compassion plunged alive in their beautiful home-built shells into boiling water. In nature they cluster together in colonies, so hopefully they will not succumb to too many diseases in this intensive form of agriculture. There's no need to feed them, but their filtering habits mean that they're brilliant at accumulating toxins, one of the reasons I never eat the blighters. As a cameraman I rather relish the repeating shapes they make. As a sailor I'd rather they weren't there, clutter up the place, but for the locals it's jobs so it seems as benign a way as you can imagine to exploit this lovely space for profit. Apart from oil and sheep farming, the seafood business is all that's available by way of gainful employment on these islands. That glorious morning we sailed sedately up the six mile stretch of Ronus Vaux and out towards the open Atlantic. The geology continued to be astonishing. These are among the oldest rocks on the surface of the planet. They were formed around three billion years ago, deep down below the Earth's crust, where it's all hot and mushy, where they formed into rough layers like a pile of wet lasagna a hundred miles deep. 
They were then forced to the surface by a bubble of molten hot stuff from below, being folded and twisted madly as they came up, so the fault lines between layers are every which way. At one time these rocks were mighty mountains bigger than the Alps. Shetland is but the stump of a hard place, stuck out in the North Atlantic, where it's under the relentless assault of the ocean rollers driven here by the prevailing westerlies. Then Shetland bobbed up and down a bit with a million years of ice ages, creating the dramatically cliffed deep water vows that are the distinctive feature of this place and which prompted the Vikings to decide that this looked and felt like home. Damn, this is so different from the gentle muddy salt marshes of my native East Anglia. But what a place for a sea kayaker. Up here in Shetland, with its crenellated cliffs, you can see why they do it. I too feel the desire to get in close. I envy the kayakers their youth. But here I am, an old bloke in a well-found small boat in a brilliant place on a lovely day, having a sail that will remain with me for the rest of my life. As my old dad used to say, count your blessings and forget your woes. As we headed on south, the breeze started to freshen and she started to get into the groove. This is the Centaur bungee steering. It's doing pretty well, actually. It's quite rough. As the old centaur clacked and bobbed while self-steering her way past these ancient headlands, she went from regions of old to new. Some the three billion year old Methuselahs, others 500 million year old Johnny Come Lakeleys laid down when Shetland was a tropical paradise the other side of the equator. Listen to the names mankind has given to these billion year old formations. To read them out sounds like poetry coming down to us from our forefathers. Father Ochran, head brainess, villains of Hamnovo, head of Stanchi, the Bruddens, Ishaness, the Runk, the Drongs, Dorhelm, Nibon, Nebin, Say, Hamar, Vementry, Braganess, Papa Little, Tubrek, Catfell. Bloody marvellous, aren't they? Of course, the rocks don't care what we call them. Our existence as humans is but a blip in time to them. It had been a lovely sail, not a drop of rain, plenty of sun. Feckin' cold, but that was all right. It's midsummer, Shetland. What do you expect? A girl in a bikini? Which reminds me. You may know that after this, there are only 11 more films in the series. After that, the Seagate hard drive will have been drained of all its scenery and stories. That drive can tell of sailing a small boat across a frighteningly windy Pentland Firth at night into the perfect shelter of Loch Erebol, where the Arctic convoys gathered in preparation for their dangerous cargo-laden journeys through the Nazi U-boat packs, bringing solace and American-made weapons to Russia. Down to the North Minch with its wondrous dragon's teeth rocks, to the Summer Isles where the beaches are whiter than a newsreader's teeth through the Kyle of Lacouch to Hander, Loch Dranbui, Tobermory, a corker of a sail down the Sound of Mole, twice through Corrivrecking just for kicks, through the dozen or so locks of the Crinan Canal and down to Glasgow. I've not done any filming on Harris in Stornoway, Scalpe, Lewis, Barra, the back of Sky, Sanday, Rum, Barra, Egg, Cole, Tyree, Collinsay, Isla and Jura. I've run out of money and have sold the boat, so I can't get there at the moment. Maybe one of the bikini sailing girls from YouTube will come up here and tell you about these places. Although fuck. If you want to see films of this quality, wit and excellence, then KTL is the only game in town. All I have to do is to get 5% of you long-term KTL YouTube users to follow the link below and chip in a few bucks or quid through PayPal and the films can continue. If not, the only sailing films you and your slightly embarrassed wives will have to watch on your big tellies is clickbait bikinis. Around 12,000 avid KTL followers have somehow or other forgotten to feed the donkey. I'm sure it was a simple lapse of memory or decency. If you want to watch my films without this bollocks in the middle, you can do it via my website, 
And yes, they're still all fusking free. But there's a PayPal button underneath them. 98.5% of you will ignore the PayPal button, but at least you saw it. Should come round. We sailed on south with a strong wind shoving us onwards. As we came down through St Magnus Bay and past Muckle Row, we had to motor a bit, but there's nothing wrong with that because we were back close under those old rocks. Such a lot of wondrous stuff to marvel at and put our brief human existence into perspective. In a place as glorious as this, even motoring is a pleasure. Still not as good as sailing though. Then, as we turned the corner between Swarback's Min and Buster Bow, the waves flattened out and the wind came blasting at us from the east. That glorious miracle of wind in sail and hull on water took over. We were going against a very modest ebb tide, but with the strong wind just ahead of the beam, we rolled out the full Genoa and with a single reef in the main, the old girl started to pick up some real speed. 5.5 knots is a broad rate in a crap boat. The tiller started to gently vibrate under Jill's hand as the boat really started to go at it. She was just flying along at 6.5 knots against a quarter of a knot of ebb tide. I have never before nor ever since experienced such a thing. The powerful wind, the flat water, the gentle heel meant that those slightly canted toading keels were sucking out all the leeway. The boat was sailing absolutely perfectly. I had no idea a centaur could do such a thing. I'm just going to let these shots run for a bit. You'll seldom see a centaur going as well as she is here. Just imagine how a decent boat would be travelling under these conditions. against the tide. Absolutely amazing. So it's just a nice run up. We're just reaching across here, across the um, Min, coal deep. Then we're going to sail up here to Bray. And there are pontoons in electricity. And the boat is going superbly. And then, just as we were getting ready to drop the sails, they appeared. Like dragonflies in the breeze. The most stripped out basic sailing machines yet designed by man. When on a fast moving windsurfer, you are part of the physics of the machine. You feel the wind through the straining muscles of your upper body and the waves through your legs and feet. As a former windsurfer, I miss the physical perfection of the thing. I have never felt so in touch with speed as when I was windsurfing. It beats bikes, horses and dinghies into a cocked hat. Clearly, Jill and I weren't the only ones out here relishing this perfect day for fast sailing. But suddenly, our 6.6 knots didn't seem that much at all. Still, it was one of the top five sails experienced by this ancient mariner. Go in front of this other yacht, Jill. Fender on the right. Bray, Bray, such a dull place, can barely fill but half a day. Super safe, brand new council pontoons, showers, supermarket and a pub. The boats here are different from our previous Shetland harbours. Recreational vessels outnumber the working boats by three to one. There's oil money here, you see, comes from the nearby Sullum Vaux. Loads of dinghies and windsurfers and almost every vessel held down by concrete blocks. 
even the big ones. This must be a very windy place, which I guess is why it's home to the Shetland Windsurfing Club. The village has absolutely nothing to commend it apart from the overall neatness. I could never live in Bray and I don't say that very often about a place so close to the sea. That night we dined in the award winning chip shop. It was bloody good. It bills itself as the most northerly chip shop in Britain and therefore I presume the world. Jill ate the local mussels. She declared them absolutely delicious and seems to have escaped unharmed. I'm a pie man myself. I like my meat cooked to buggery. I got up early the next morning. This far in the north it's light by two so while Jill buried herself in the forepeak under a pile of sleeping bags trying to pretend that she had a less hyper husband, I fired up the engine and chug fuggered out into Buster Vaux. Look at that vista opening up. What a treat. Not really Essex, is it? Amazingly, the muscle men were up harvesting already. It looks like bloody hard work to me. Then the wind arrived. Flat water, which is great. Brief main again as per usual. Uh, there are three things that you can go up. You can go up to Vaux, you can go up to uh, Eight. But uh, first of all, I'm going into this little labyrinth of channels behind uh, an island called Ventri Vemetry. Strange name. This fantastic labyrinth. Look. So we come from here. It was a beat out of here against the tide, around the back of Muckle Row, in front of Papa Little, and then um, we're coming in across here and into the, this little place here, which is called Uyia Sound. Uyia Sound. No idea how to pronounce that. I thought it would be rather fun to circumnavigate Vementry, shaped like a piece from a jigsaw puzzle, with a seriously narrow gap between it and mainland Shetland. In the Second World War, the island was transformed into a massive gun emplacement to keep the pesky jerrys at bay. The attraction for me was the gap, just a few yards wide and only slightly deeper than the keels on the Centaur. I always like to think that the only thing between me and the rocks is the occasional sea kayaker, and there he was. My heart was pounding as we came up to it. Take a look at the charts of the route. Jolly good fun. All done without a chart plotter.
about uh, five feet. So. Attacking, um, coming to about 10 yards from each shore, and it's still 15 meters. But every now and again, there's this sort of thing, which is a bit of a frightening thing to see. It's going to see if it's on the chart. Intuitively, the uh, chart shows the channel running along here. And there's this island called Green, and it is an island, and it appears to have two sheep on it. So we've got 37 metres underneath us, surprisingly. Um, Jill did just spot a rock that I didn't know was there. So we are going very carefully. And then after this island, um, Green and Linga, we then head pretty close to a little pair of islands and then to Swarbrick's head. Sheep, did you swim there? And then after this island, um, Green and Linga, we then head pretty close to a little pair of islands and then to Swarbrick's head. So we uh, came down here, round here, round Papa Little, into New Year Sound, through this tiny gap here, round here, Mr. Rock there, just 
uh, around these two islands and up back to Swarbrick's Head and then we'll come into Swarbrick's Min. You can tell us Swarbrick's Head because uh, it's got three gun emplacements on it. Nothing unique in that, but this one still has the gun. I guess removing it was a bit hard. No, 32 meters. This is the racing fleet from 8th. They're doing a round papa apparently today. It was the annual regatta. Three yachts and a mobo. In Shetland, they race with dodgers and spray hood deployed. And why not? Just beating up towards 8th now. The sort of racing fleet coming down here and they're going around Papa Little. Uh, I don't know whether we'll see them again. Maybe, maybe, maybe as they come back down this side. So we're going to beat up to 8th, just take some pictures and then... Sheds here, I don't know what these were. Kids playground.
What about that house then? Yes, I like that one. That one, okay. Let's have that one. So I quite like that going on there. You like the green one? The new one. Okay, let's have that one. the people who thought they were building it for themselves, but they're building it for us. Oh, you just go, building man say, I want one like that. The names are growing on me. We've got, um, down at eight, we've got East Borough Fourth. We've got Sound of Huben Setter, Colness, Grobsness, Point of Muller, Ness of Noonsborough, Songerness, Vaux of Clouster, Dister, Muckle. You see the word Muckle a lot. We then went up through the gap between Papa Little and the mainland where the semi-redundant plant from the partially resting fish farm was all over the place. Some bits afloat and some scattered across the pastures. Bloody mess. Then a quick whip around Linga and back towards the Atlantic. As we came around Muckle Row and into the Min, Shetland did one of those amazing weather changes. The moggy mist suddenly rolled away and the sun came out. Woohoo! And the wind died. We motored then and followed the coast for a few hours with the engine, our two cylinder diesel sipping Sven the Volvo, chugging away beneath us. There was only one bit of difficult navigation when we came inside Papa Stur. We had to do some back bearings on one of the rocks to avoid another lot. Yet again, I wished I had a chart plotter. Tips of the island with the mainland. 230 degrees and then 265 in a certain direction and then back taking a back bearing on the island and then out on 60 degrees. Generally, I'm not in favour of dodgers because they slow down the boat and they get in the view. But here in Shetland, the weather has not been perfect. So we have had the dodgers on a fair bit. But that means that when you're, you know, it's windy and you're sitting down and you're hiding behind the dodgers, you can't really see. So my wife has come up with the solution of uh, just taking one down. Because you're going along the coast, you always want to be looking at the coast, you know, the sea is pretty much the sea. So you, the, the land for the last few days has been on our left hand side. 
and so we've got one dodger up. So we get shelter so that we can see and we get the view. Good day. Then towards evening the weather went a little bit awry and it started raining. The spray hood went up, the camera was put away, Jill went below to cook and I stood out in the rain watching the scenery drift by. Our planned journey to Scalloway was put on hold and we headed for the nearest council pontoons at Skelda. It was too wet for the good camera but I shot this on the little waterproof one. We're gonna, we dropped the hook in the first. And then about three o'clock, the wind started howling and it started raining. So we thought it's going to be a good place to spend the night. And about two hours away is Skelda, which is a new marina, which was built a couple of years ago. It's got showers, it's got washing machines, it's got electricity. And uh, since I'm now soaking, then uh, electricity is a good thing because it gives me a chance to dry stuff out. So we're going to go and hide here for uh, the night and see what the next morning brings. Quite a lot of rocks to avoid on the way, and visibility was declining fast. And as you can see, it is raining a bit. Oh, a magnificent collection of lobster pots here. Look at all those. Gracious me, look the size of that monster. Let's go right on the end there, look. So we'll put it on the right hand side. Yeah. That is a big yacht. Major yacht. I'm sorry about the wet end to this film, but this is real sailing. We were there for three nights and two days. I saw, walked and observed every square inch of the place. Bugger all internet too. beside this. <laughs> the other thing I'm curious about is to why mobos think that they need so many aerials. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven aerials. 11 aerials. Uh, Shetlanders do occasionally do weird things. And uh, there are these things. Just on this road bridge. Some... And then there's this. Uh, you know, I have no idea what that is. Here is a Disney character, a wooden cow maybe, it's had its head knocked off. And there is a flashing dwarf. It's got a little penis. Not nice. 
with the little bits of art and insanity, I just think that the people who live in, in, in low population areas, they feel a need to put their mark on the landscape. I've noticed it in America, you see giant cabbages, or one man had a flock of turkeys made out of old plough parts, or they bury cars up to their nose. It's just something to say, this is me. Uh, they're validating themselves in some way. One other weird tradition up here is they put furniture in the bus stops. There's one with a sofa, there's another one with a computer that doesn't work, it's just there for effect. Standard lamp and um, for a while there was a dummy being moved around from bus stop to bus stop all over the island. Well, you watched another of my films right to the end. Good job. You are part of an elite who watches YouTube films in snatches of more than 15 seconds. You're a good man, an intelligent man, certainly a sailor, aged between 50 and 70, probably a small boat owner yourself. I bet you even have a pretty good idea of what a centaur costs to run 500 miles from home. I assume it's not the first of my films that you've watched right through to the end might even be a habit that you've had for several years. Maybe you're downloading them and squirrelling them away on a hard drive. And why not? They're a great exposition of intelligent sailing. Beautifully shot, creatively edited, lovely music, informative, well-researched and beautifully read voiceover. In a class of its own, in fact. The trouble is, someone forgot to feed the donkey. YouTube, you see, gives me not a penny. No cash flow, no boat, no more filming. It was the first time in my 61 years that I've sold a boat I wanted to keep. Beautiful, reliable engine. I shall never see its like again. The trouble is that not enough of the fine, intelligent sailors who enjoy these little epics thought it at all necessary to chip in. One bloke said, I suppose I'd assumed that Dylan Winter was some kind of millionaire philanthropist with a talent for amateur filmmaking who thinks sailing a crap boat to interesting places was in some way cooler than sailing a good one. Now I realise that you've run out of money and have had to sell your boat, I see how I created this little delusion in my own head to justify not contributing in any way to the cost of all those hours I've sailed with you. Do you feel like that? It's not too late. The project can be saved. There are 11 more films after this. That's 11 more chances for you to try to get into the habit of becoming a patron of the art of intelligent sailing, paying a fair price for your entertainment and ensuring an ongoing flow of sailing films that do not feature pulchitudinous, scantily clad girls waving their perfect tushies at a GoPro while emoting about dolphins. The link to the dreaded PayPal button is under this film, or on the top right of my website. If you have been listening, thanks. <laughs>